I'm halfway through my program of deanery visits now, which began back in November. Each day begins with a Eucharist, uh, with the clergy and sometimes LLMs. And on every visit so far, I've offered a reflection on the very first verse in the Bible, on the theme of leadership in chaos. At this midpoint, it seems right to move on to a different passage and message. But here's the text and the talk for those who would find it helpful as you navigate forwards. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Most situations of ministry and leadership we encounter in our lives are predictable and well-ordered. We appeal to precedent and patterns. Our Anglican tradition is deeply rooted in the Benedictine tradition, with its stress on stability and order. We love to do at this time of year more or less what we did at the same time last year. We love the natural seasons and rhythms of the year and the seasons of the liturgical calendar. We lean back into the patterns and shapes which give meaning to our lives in regular time. Every so often in our lives, we will experience a step in our individual journey which disrupts all of that pattern and order for a time, and then things will go back to normal. Many of us will ex have experienced this in vocational junctions and in transitions between posts. Becoming an incumbent for the first time can be disorientating at first, as can a step into retirement. Ministering in a local crisis in a parish can throw everything awry, and so can illness in ourselves or our family or bereavement or any number of crises. But over the last two and a bit years, we've experienced a massive disruption, not just to our own ministries, but to the whole world and the whole life of the church. The disruption of COVID has been followed by the terrible war in Ukraine, which feels very close to home, and by the steepest increase in the cost of living for a generation. The foundations have been shaken. We've probably not yet taken in the depth and extent of the effect of COVID on all our lives and on our churches and communities. Where are we to go for inspiration in how to lead in such a time as this? Genesis 1 has long seemed to me to be a text on leadership and a particular kind of leadership, leadership in chaos. According to Old Testament scholarship, the text originated in the time of the exile. In that context, it's a remarkable statement of faith. The vivid and terrible pictures we've seen of Ukrainians leaving their homes for an unknown future remind us of the suffering of the people of Jerusalem 600 years before the birth of Christ. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the armies of Babylon. Many of those who survived the terrible siege were taken into captivity in what is now Iraq. Psalm 137 gives us still a taste of all that they endured. The exile asked hard questions of faith in a time of chaos, and those questions needed to be answered. What did all this suffering mean for the people of God? Were the idols in the mighty city of Babylon really stronger than the God of Israel? We find part of the response in Genesis 1, a calm and ordered account of the creation of the universe by the God of Israel. But note where that account begins, not with nothing at all, but with chaos. In the beginning, says Genesis, the earth is without form and void. The Hebrew term is beautifully onomatopoeic. You have to say it several times aloud to get the sense, tohu vabuhu. Everything is darkness and water. And remember that the sea is the great symbol of chaos and death throughout the ancient Near East. What is happening in the midst of chaos? The Spirit of God is brooding, brooding over the face of the waters. And then God creates by water, by word, and by spirit. 
The pattern of creation is that God orders and divides and separates and brings great beauty in life, culminating in the creation of humankind and of the Sabbath. There are lessons for us here. Part of our role at this time is to help bring a new order out of chaos and disruption, not only in the church, but in the communities we serve. We're only probably part way through the chaos and effect of the pandemic, as we all know. It's been heart stretching to listen to the different accounts of all that our churches have done and of the cost of that to so many. We need to acknowledge the crises in many professions because of the additional demands in health and social care in our schools and in many other walks of life. But there's now also a deep weariness among our clergy and lay ministers and lay officers. Over the first six months of this series of visits, I've observed a number of changes in morale over that time. In November, the two words I heard most were weariness and hope in more or less equal proportions. In December, hope was deferred, put off, with the arrival of the Omicron variant and the cancellation of many Christmas services. In January and early February, there was a sense that many were at the very limit of our own resources. In March and April, hope and energy have been returning. It's been great to see, but the challenges remain. One image from many conversations stand out. Many clergy have used the picture of beginning the pandemic as if it was a sprint and then discovering it was, in fact, a marathon, a very long one. But one person said to me that even this does not do justice to how it's felt. A better image was imagining you've had to learn every discipline in the modern pentathlon from scratch and to an Olympic standard and then you go on and train for the next one. So I'm in awe and deep appreciation for what the clergy and lay ministers and church officers of the diocese have achieved through these last uh, two and a half years. Thank you. You have done magnificently, magnificently. Many come to this point and feel they've fallen short in some way and have been stretched beyond themselves. But from my perspective, this is not the case. The depth of pastoral care, the outreach into the community, mastering new skills, gently steering churches through new challenges, all have been extraordinary. But as we reflect together on how best to lead at this moment in the evolving chaos of the world, may I draw all of our attention to three themes in Genesis chapter 1. The first is that of brooding. The Spirit of God broods over the face of the waters. The word to, to brood is genuinely the word used of a hen on her nest, waiting for her eggs to hatch. And it carries two meanings in combination. There is first a hopeful, patient and expectant waiting for new life and something new to emerge. And the second is loving care. That seems to be a very good model for ministry at the present time. There are very few consistent patterns as yet. There are different needs in different places. Different sections of our society and different communities have been affected in many different ways. There are still unexpected events and wrong turns. How are you brooding and taking time to reflect on what's needed in this season? I think all of us will need more of that kind of time, not less in these months. We need to free ourselves from our own and others' expectations in terms of what we should be doing and looking honestly at how things are unfolding. I found in myself, once it was possible to be out and about again in the final months of last year, there was a great temptation to put too much into the diary. When I looked within, I found two strong motivations. The first was to try and get everything back to normal as swiftly as possible. And the second was somehow to try and make up for lost time. Both, I think, were very misguided. The second theme from the passage is to pay attention to the wise ordering of time. This is a major theme in Genesis 1, as you will know. Even God 
does not do all of the work of creation in a single day. We all know the refrain that runs through the passage. There is evening and there is morning, the first day. Eugene Peterson draws attention very helpfully to the Hebrew concept of time, which begins in the evening. The day begins in the evening, not with work, but with rest. For the first part of every 24 hours, we rest and sleep. The world is on God's shoulders, not ours. And then we rise in the morning to join in what God is already doing for the work of that day. And we lay it down again in the evening. The ordering of our time is likely to be a key factor in the next part of our journey. None of us have been this way before. None of us knows exactly how to do this. We're all learning new patterns and responsibilities and skills. And we'll need to sit lightly to them and exercise patience and to lean back again, not into our old patterns and rhythms, but to the Benedictine principles which lie beneath them, a balancing continually the three priorities of prayer, rest and work, and weaving them into a sustainable new pattern of life and ministry. And my third theme for reflection is the Sabbath. It's remarkable to reflect that the high point of the creation story, as told by the exiles in Babylon, is not the creation of humankind on the sixth day. The high point of the story is the profound creation of the Sabbath, the hallowing of the seventh day. At this point in our journey, as we navigate the various crises facing the world, we will need to remember in profound ways what it means to be human. What makes us truly human, according to the creation story in Genesis, is the ability to share in Sabbath, the ability to rest, to reflect, to enjoy God and God's creation. And it's this that separates us and sets us apart from the created world. Sabbath means far more than giving ourselves permission to have regular days off and holidays, important though these are. Sabbath is part of our essential identity as human beings. We are created for more than work. We are created to share in communion with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in delighting in creation, in people, in one another, and in God's church. In that resting recreation and delight, we find the strength to continue to offer leadership and ministry in chaos. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. May God bless you as you reflect on this brooding, on the right ordering of our time and on the precious gift of Sabbath.